we are really pleased that one of our Simpson speakers this year is the Reverend Dr. Lena Anderson. And we are pleased that he is going to be preaching for us at chapel here. A little bit about Lena. Lena is a graduate of Dalhousie University and Acadia University, and he was ordained to Christian ministry in 2001. Since 1999, he has served as senior pastor of the church in which he was born and raised, a church which has grown under his leadership into a blended community of worshippers from diverse geographic, ethnic, cultural, and denominational backgrounds. A retired commissioned officer in the Canadian Forces, where he served as unit chaplain for HMSC Scotian. Reverend Anderson has been recognized with numerous awards, including the Medal of Excellence from the Navy League of Canada, the Canadian Forces Decoration Medal, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Lieutenant Governor's Award for Citizenship, and an honorary Doctor of Divinity from St. Thomas Christian College. Maclean's magazine named Reverend Anderson as one of five Canadian pastors who are breathing new life into their communities. In 2016, he received the ADC Alumni Distinguished Service Award for significant contributions to ministry in his community and beyond. The Reverend Anderson has worked tirelessly to promote racial justice with organizations such as the City of Halifax, the Halifax Regional Centre for Education, the Halifax Regional Police, and the African United Association of Nova Scotia. Lennett is married to Dr. Kesa Monroe Anderson. They have three children. They live in Hammonds Plains, Nova Scotia. And beyond all of that, he's one of the few people how, who I will allow more than 18 minutes at chapel, which may be one of the biggest awards that I've mentioned so far. Lennett, we are really pleased that you are part of this event, as we are pleased that you're part of our faculty life, for that is very important to us as a community. And after the scripture reading, we are looking forward to hear you speak for us and to us as one of us. So thank you very much for that. Good morning. My name is Glenn Wooden and I teach here at Acadia Divinity College and I'm going to be reading scripture this morning. It's taken from Acts chapter 10 verses 1 to 15. In Caesarea there was this man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort as it was called, devout and fearing God along with all of his household, a generous giver of alms to the poorer people, praying to God constantly. One afternoon at about three o'clock, the man had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God entering toward him and saying, Cornelius. He stared at the angel and filled with fear, he said, what is it, sir? The angel answered, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now, send men to Joppa to summon a certain Simon. He's called Peter. He's being hosted by a Simon, a tanner, whose home is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who were loyal to him. And after explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray at about noon. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and a container coming down, something like a large sheet being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. He heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, never, sir, 
for at no time have I eaten anything that's impure or unclean. The voice said to him a second time, what God has made clean, you must not make impure. The word of the Lord. Well, good morning, family, and thank you so much for the kind words and for extending my time. It is much appreciated on this morning to the esteemed uh, faculty members and for extending this invitation. I am truly humbled uh, to be here in chapel yet again. I am elated, excited, and delighted to be afforded this opportunity. My brothers and sisters in Christ and creation, this morning I stand boldly, unashamedly, unapologetically celebrating the biblical truth that our God calls us to embrace and not exclude. Celebrating the biblical truth that all of God's people must be embraced. I'm confident in the fact that we need to bend towards justice for the heart of God is justice. Let's celebrate our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who tore down the middle wall of separation, created unity in the family, and where there were animosity, historical hostility, Christ accomplished reconciliation within his family. I invite us to stand today in the truth of Ephesians chapter 2, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. The result, beloved, is that we are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but we are now fellow citizens with the saints and the members of God's household. Thanks be to God. I thank Dr. Wooden for reading the scripture and our hearing today. And with that scripture text in mind, I want to preach for a, a few minutes on the subject, on the theme, progressive vision, embrace the human race. Father, in this hour of proclamation, I ask even now that you would stir up the gift of God that is within me, that you would fan into flame the fire that burns. God, that you would occupy my thought, that you would bridle my tongue, and that you would give listening to every hearer. Jesus, please watch over this word to perform it in our lives this day. May it be living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Speak now for your servants are listening. This is our prayer, that what you revealed in the preparation and the meditation will be now manifested in the proclamation. In Jesus' name, amen. I am consumed with the reality that God who we serve has never called us, caused us to be stagnant in our relationship with him, nor our relationship with one another. Our God is always calling us, causing us to move forward, progressive, calling us to move to places that we might not be able to understand right now, calling us to do things that seemingly are beyond our ability to examine and embrace truths that are not our lived reality calling us to have progressive vision. This God is pulling us, stretching us, moving us to places and moments where we can experience things we have never begun to imagine. Our God expects us to be people who will follow his command and his leading for the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. May we be a people who are always pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. The only problem is sometimes, beloved, because we are so inclined to do things our way, we retard the process and the progress. We delay, we hold back the productivity that could be our reality simply because we're stuck and have blurred vision. And thus, as a consequence, every now and then, God will have to give us a reality check, an eye examination, because it's a terrible thing to have sight and no vision. I submit to you this morning that God has a vision for his church that might be different than the vision we have for the church. 
Although we are satisfied with doing church, studying church, going to church, uh, might he be suggesting that we ought to be the church? He is saying that I'm pulling you, stretching you, challenging you to get to a place that you have not yet occupied. Might I suggest that we as a church, as the body of Christ, as a seminary in our convention family intent, are not yet at the place where the Lord wants us to be. We are not yet at the place where we're celebrating humanity, dignity, standing in solidarity, in this right of equality and racial harmony. Not yet at the place, spiritually, relationally, communally, in terms of reconciliation, inclusion, and race relation. I'm talking fast because my time is short. Progressive vision, beloved. The text is tailored to teach us. God wants to show us that if we yet trust him, he will open our eyes to new opportunities, new experiences, new possibilities, new every day that we will embrace and include every person he calls by name. There is a surprise for your eyes. God wants to give us progressive vision. I wish I had an eyewear company because I would be passing out progressive lenses to everybody. You know I have an addiction to glasses, and I come to understand that progressive lenses aren't only an option for correcting nearsightedness and farsightedness, but they can also correct defectiveness. What? The, the distortion in your vision. Oh, how do we see other people? If you've walked with Jesus for any amount of time, there ought to be a surprise in your eyes. Put that in the chat. A surprise for my eyes. Throughout the New Testament, if you read the Holy Writ, you will come to understand that the gospel appears to be a series of surprises. The portrayal of the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus the Christ in the gospel might be termed a series of surprises. Where do you see that, Leonard? I'm so glad you asked. The stone was rolled away from the tomb, and Mary Magdalene was surprised. The disciples who, react, who arrived at the burial site found the tomb empty, and they were surprised. Jesus taught with a fresh revelation of the law, with an authority not seen before or since, and the disciples were surprised. Jesus said, love your neighbor and even your enemies. Surprise. He said, pray for those who despitefully use you. Bless those who curse you. Forgive them 70 times 7. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Jesus went further to reach people and to reconcile them to God. He was crossing political lines, cultural margins, historical boundaries. So the question for your eye examination is, when was the last time there was a surprise for your eye? Come on, take a stroll down memory lane. Think back to when you were shocked beyond belief and you found yourself uttering the words, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know that would happen. This was totally unexpected. I mean, when was the last time you had that jaw-dropping, eye-widening, mouth-opening experience where you stood amazed in his presence? I grew up in the old Baptist church with the big church mothers with the big hats and the wide hips, hand on the hip, leaning back, singing the story. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And oh, how he would love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior love for me. As we navigate our way, because i got to get to the text, that's my introduction. As we, get, we make, make our way to the text, there are defining moments and movements that the Holy Spirit sees in the book of Acts. Look for the progressive vision. Sometimes God will put the greatest blessing in the strangest places, <clears throat> Peter. Look for progressive vision. Sometimes he will teach you that Christianity is not a religion of information, but a relationship of transformation and reconciliation. Surprise. That faith does not limit itself to behavioral modification, but it extends itself to a heart transformation. Surprise. That God does his best work from the inside out. This scripture 
the Spirit of God gives us the master's plan for his church. Simply embrace the human race. God's call is to embrace, not erase, to include, not exclude, to celebrate, not tolerate. You ought to celebrate yourself. Put that in the chat. Celebrate myself. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Every day of my life is written in his book. He saw my substance being yet uninformed. I'll celebrate myself. I am here to inform some and remind others that your presence in the planted, plan it, has purpose. He breathed into us the breath of life, and God made us living souls. You are not a coincidence, a coincidence, a happenstance. You are not an accident. You have been strategically, divinely, providentially, intentionally placed on the planet for such a time as this. Surprise. Surprise. Celebrate yourself because you're the apple of his eye. Surprise. That was not always my mentality. That was not always my reality because in my story, there were times when I was celeb mm -mm, tolerated, not celebrated. Very low self-esteem. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and I had to get to the place where I realized that my value does not decrease based on someone's inability to see my worth. <sighs> that he sees our worth when others do not. I'm convinced that God is about to blow our minds in this text because the mere fact that God will include who we have intentionally excluded. I don't know why we're surprised because he's consistent in his character. Huh? Our God is rich in mercy. He is righteous in all of his ways all loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call upon his name. He shines on the just and the unjust. He demonstrates his love towards us that while we were yet, you're acting a monkey, my translation, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, anybody can raise their hand and say, I'm a whosoever. There is no inconsistency in his character, but there is unpredictability in his activity. I say amen myself because there's crickets in here. There is no inconsistency in his character, but there's unpredictability in his activity. That's an E flat. Mm -hmm. Because while, while we can predict who he will be, we cannot predict how he will do it. Uh, his ways are not our ways. This is the Lord's doing, and it ought to be marvelous in our eyes that red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in his sight. We must have a heart transformation if there's going to be reconciliation in the church. The early days of Christianity were exciting. I have to get to the text. I'm sorry. The, the early days of Christianity were exciting as God's spirit moved and the people's lives were transformed. Converts were pouring in from surprising backgrounds. Even the dreaded Saul, now Paul, became a Christian surprise. <laughs> Non-Jews were responding to the good news surprise. And among the first of these was this Roman captain, Cornelius. Chapter 10, Cornelius is the turning point in the story. Because up until now, those who were scattered by persecution from Jerusalem had been preaching the gospel only to Jews. They had a blurred vision, not a progressive vision. But in this scripture text this morning, we will note how they can overcome their prejudices and realize everybody ought to know who Jesus is. According to the scripture, we're introduced to two extremes as I tried to land the plane. Two extremes, two characters, two personalities. You see Cornelius and you see Brother Peter. You know Cornelius the Gentile. Cornelius the centurion of the Roman military. The one of Italian descent. You know Cornelius. The one that's been praying and his arms have gone up to heaven. Cornelius is the example of God using you to reach other people, those that have a desire. God's willingness to use extraordinary means to reach those who have a desire to find him and meet him. Cornelius is on the outside, hmm, longing to be accepted 
on the inside. Oh, I'm going to preach in a minute. Listen, and then we have Brother Peter. You all know Peter. Peter, the rock. Peter, you know, I mean, Peter, sorry. Peter, Peter, the example uh, of God's willingness to use us in spite of us. Can somebody raise their hand and take the stand and that God is willing to use me in spite of me, knowing all about me, knowing that my strength, his strength is made perfect in my weakness, knowing that there's a thorn in my side and yet his grace is still sufficient, knowing that I have a tissue for my issue. Can somebody say he'll use me in spite of me, knowing that Peter had a heart murmur, Peter had a heart issue, Peter only thought that the God gospel word for people that look like him, talk like him, walk like him, live like him. Peter, y'all know Peter. Peter, who did not want to be associated with people hmm, that were outside of his vicinity, not keeping his company, not in his proximity. Peter, in his sovereignty, God will place you in the vicinity with people you don't like. Uh, surprise. God will place you in a vicinity with people you don't even care for. Ha, huh, yeah, they join your church. Mm-hmm. They're on your deacon board. Oh, Lord. Never mind. They in your class. Hello, somebody. Listen, the apostle Peter was logging with Simon a Tanner. Surprise. God begins to cut away Peter's prejudices to have him stay many days with this man, Simon. This man whose trade made Peter likely repulsive. To be a Tanner was not desirable or socially acceptable acceptable in Israel. A tanner had to deal with dead animals contrary to the ceremonial practices of that day. And it would seem to me that God is trying to discipline his disciple to understand his destiny. Where are you going? God will, will, God will, God will discipline his disciple so that he can understand the destiny. I'm not where I should be. But God will discipline the disciple. You do understand that the only difference between disciple and discipline is the word in, I in. Spell it. Come on. Discipline ought to be in the disciple. Oh, Lord. I just want you to know that God is trying to discipline his disciples so that we can get to the destiny where everybody is in the body of Christ. Peter had some issues. Peter had some prejudices against the Gentiles that needed to be changed. And I want to submit that maybe you and I have some prejudices, some stereotypes, some ideology and philosophy that need to be changed. Hear me well. Prejudice, discrimination, segregation, all in the text. It was a fact in biblical times. It's a fact in our times. Surprise. Not really. And yet the biblical truth from Acts 17, 26 is that he is made from one blood every nation. There are many cultures in this world, many various distinctives, distinctions, but there is one blood. I have to hasten on. You'll remember the end of of Matthew when we received the great commission to go therefore into the world to preach the gospel to all nations. Yes, the church started in Jerusalem and had to go to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Remember, you ought to stay here, dwell right here, Acts chapter 1. In the upper room, tell you I visited with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, he'll make you witnesses. Yes, in Jerusalem. Yes, in Judea. Yes, in Samaria, those mixed race people. And to the uttermost parts of the world. We understand that, that Acts chapter 10 is a monumental account of the record of God's word. And he's using Peter as the key to open the doors of the church. How wide are your doors? How wide are the doors at your church, especially when you're the key? <laughs> Lord, can I preach the text? Peter is the key. It's not that he has keys. Peter is the key. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail to end to you. I give the keys to the kingdom. You have keys, Peter. God is opening the doors of his church. He's opening the church wide open. Is your church wide enough to receive everybody God has in your community? The key to those days was Peter. 
He's the one that gave the revelation that they are like the Christ, the proclamation, sorry. He's the one that preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls got saved. So when there was a spiritual explosion in Jerusalem, Peter was the one that was moving. He was the preacher to the unsaved, the teacher to the saints. He was the dominant figure in the early church. God was using Peter as the contact, the point of contact between the spirit of God and the people of God. And the only problem in the story is that the one with the keys had heart murmur. Right. The one with the keys to the church of Jesus Christ didn't have people that looked different than him in his circle. Well, I just grew up with people that look like me. I talk to people that look like me. I shop with people that look like me. That's your problem. We were told yesterday, church, there's a problem. Peter's been raised his whole lifetime and drained, ingrained with Jewish tradition, ingrained with legalism, ingrained with supranationalism. Peter, you don't see people how I see people. You have blurred vision. Can I give you progressive vision? I'm going to show you a brother, Peter, who is seeking me, praying for me, Cornelius. Both of them were praying. Peter were praying too. Cornelius was seeking and praying at 3 o'clock. The next day, Peter at 12 o'clock is hungry. Go up on the roof and start praying. Here's what we discover in the text, Dr. Britton, the concurrence of divine utterance. What he said, I said is the concurrence of divine utterance. God visited Peter through a vision. God visited Cornelius through a vision. God gave the concurrence of divine utterance. God is giving them the same vision to two different people because we can't operate if we have die vision. You cannot be on the same page with a division. D division. Okay, I know it's called division. Come on, come on. If you're on one page and I'm on the other page, that's called division. When God will give you one vision, put that in the chat. One vision, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God that's in all, through all, working in us all. One got the revelation, one got the confirmation that the kingdom of God is to include and not exclude. And Peter is hungry. I'm almost at the end of the text. Thanks be unto God. And Peter, Peter's hungry. This is not hungry Larry or Bottomless Billy. No, Peter is hungry. And look at the sense of humor of our God. You're hungry. I'll give you something to eat. I'll slap you into a trance. So you know it's of God. The Spirit of God, a visitation whew, from heaven. And he saw heaven open. For the first time, the visitation is correcting his vision. Maybe if we get a visitation, it will correct our vision. Jesus. I bet the request by God to eat something unclean shocked Peter but not as much as what came next, God's rebuke. <laughs> we focus on the request. Peter focused on the rebuke. Do not call anything impure that I have made clean. Peter scratching his head. This is a jaw dropping. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Peter was puzzled and shocked. How could God be calling me to, to, to something that is obviously unclean? Peter is proud of the fact that I've never associated, I've never been affiliated. I don't keep company with people like that, oh, with food like that. We sometimes, we sometimes have the same legalism because we sometimes define ourselves by the things we do not do. Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> There ought to be some things that we do not do. If we name the name of Christ, we ought to walk worthy of our calling. But what is wrong is defining our spirituality based on the things we refrain from doing. I grew up hearing the joke, I don't drink, I don't swear, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls who do. Ha, 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 ha. That's not funny. 
Because the problem is we are just as selective as Brother Peter. We're just as selective in whom we care for, in whom we minister to, in whom we support. Who are we willing to share the good news of the gospel with? Do we see those around us as our adoptive brothers and sisters? Do we stand with the other citizens of the kingdom? Does our heart break when their heart breaks? Do we weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn? Or are they just outside of our circle and I just can't relate? I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? Just feel bad and guilty? Say sorry? <laughs> it's quickly become obvious that Peter had words, heard words, that implied, oh, sorry, heard words that had greater implication than food. Peter was not to regard certain people as unclean and to avoid them. God is revealing to him that all forgiven sinners are to be accepted and included, including Gentiles at the four corners of the sheet, corresponds to the four corners of the earth, corresponds to the four points of the compass, the north, the south, the east, the west. He has the whole world in his hands. He has everybody here, right? In his hands, the sheet's contents it, it indicated the millions of people who were in Peter's world because a vision will change your world. It's the people that you meet as you're walking down the street. Who are the people in your neighborhood? God must consider racism an important issue to overcome because he performed a notable miracle to dispel the Jewish prejudice against the Gentiles. Racism is not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. Peter is getting a crash course in grace by God himself. God is trying to destroy racial barriers that have been in the heart of Peter for a long time. God is trying whoo, to hold him in a holding pattern. God has Peter in a waiting pattern because God has to address the mess in him, in you, and in me. Can we please admit that God can call us, but there's some residue from our past. God can call us, but there's some thoughts from my own life, perspectives and biases and prejudices that are still in me. Could God be saying, maybe I have you in a holding position, showing you a vision, showing you a dream, because I don't want you going forward, Peter, with this heart issue. I've given you the keys. You're about to open the door to the Gentile world, but you have to address the discriminatory practices that are in your heart, the racist instinct that's in you, because what I've called you for has not completely purged you of what I called you from. I'm ready to take my seat and go to lunch. God has put us in a holding position so that he can terminate the enemy that's in me. The enemy that's in me. He opened his eyes. He saw heaven open. We have to be troubled by what troubles the heart of God. We have to care about what God cares about. Did you not know that it's possible to be saved and still have heart murmur? It's possible to be a Christian and still have people in your church that don't look like you. It's possible to come to church every Sunday and still not care for them in that community, that vicinity. God sent him an angel and said there's no longer favoritism, no nepotism, no one-sidedness, unfairness, no prejudice or bias. Peter, I'm going to use you to send a ripple can we relate to Peter? Because sometimes we forget that no matter a person's nationality, ethnicity, sexuality, identity, philosophy, or ideology, no matter what a person's social economic standard, God wants every person on the earth to believe in him, to come to know who is life eternal. When you have a soul change, it will create a societal change. Before having the vision, Peter thought it was excluded. After the vision, he knew he had a responsibility to reach everybody. Leonard, I'm one person. I'm one person with the key to the church. 
you're one person. And yes, to the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you might be the world. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be the catalyst? You might be the stimulus. You might be the spark to get a fire going. Has it ever occurred to you that if you begin the conversation, they may join the conversation? If you stand on the right side of history, you may not be standing alone. May it occur to you that it only takes one to get the conversation started. It's called ripples of acceptance. When Peter showed up in the house, it was just a ministry of presence. Sometimes you don't have to say anything but just be present. Peter's presence meant that the gospel of Jesus was moving beyond difficult social, political, ethnic, and religious barriers. And that we are now equals in this growing family of God. I conclude with the vision that started with meditation. In verse 4, Cornelius was praying. In verse 9, Peter was praying. While praying, God became, uh, while praying, they became receptive to God's leading. I just want to say that because they were praying, they received a visitation. And I wonder if the church would assume the posture of prayer. Once again, would we get a visitation that would correct our vision? I don't know what to do, Leonard. That's a big order. Can you do, can, can we just pray? Can we pray, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. Because the text says, I seen your prayer. I've seen the alms. They've come up to me as a memorial. And because you were praying and Peter was praying, there's no division. You'll get one vision where Jesus is at the center of it all. Father, in this hour, may you be the center of it all. May you break our hearts for what breaks your heart. God, may you increase our witness, broaden our boundaries, soften our hearts. May you correct our vision and do it, God, from the inside out that the doors of the church may be open because everybody ought to know who Jesus is. We make you the center of the conversation. We make you the center of our operation. We make you the center of it all.